Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. Those of you who have been with us for a while know that we have been studying the, the life of Christ, the events that took place that were so unique in his experience. He's been baptized. He's gone out into the wilderness and been tempted by Satan. Has come back almost a year of ministry of which we know very little about. And now he is going to make himself a bit more prominent. And so let's start by going to uh, the book of Luke and start with verse 12. Chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 12. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples. And of them he chose twelve whom he also named apostles. Mm -hmm. So the, the term disciples was a broader than the 12 that we usually think of. Yes. Disciples would mean followers, learners, something like that. Apostles mean those who now have been taught and they get sent out. An apostle is someone who's sent out to do a job. So he's picking the 12 for that. He's picking the 12. So is ambassador the same word as apostle? No, and well, yeah, same. ambassador could be similar to, actually ambassador is more, more closely related to the word prophet. Ambassador would be prophet, um, something like that, yeah. So after choosing the 12, the next thing that happens is we're going to go over to Matthew 5 and the famous Sermon on the Mount. Um, <clears throat> if you go to Luke, there's a part of, part of this sermon is found, and it's called a sermon on the plain. So the first question is, was this on a mount or was it on a plain? Which is a really trivia thing. Um, Ellen White solves that problem very nicely by saying Jesus went up the mountain and then came down to a level place where the people met, which I think resolves that issue completely. But it says, Jesus saw the crowds and went up a hill where he sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. Happy are those who are spiritually poor. Now, what would spiritually poor mean? Does that mean not, much, not very much spirit? This version says poor in spirit. Poor in spirit. Yeah, what would that mean? This says the opposite of self-sufficiency. This speaks of the deep humility of recognizing one's utter spiritual bankruptcy apart from God. Okay. Is, so, hap is happy the wrong word here? Happy is the right word. It means, the, the Greek word is makarios. You've probably heard of people who are by the name of makarios. It means blessed. It means happy. It means... You know, really, you know, things are going really, really well. I guess the Pharisees would be said to have had a lot of spirit, and he's yeah. wanting the wanting something that the, they don't, that they don't want. You you can't really understand this passage until you understand something of what their thinking was in those days, because of course he was speaking to people who had a certain mindset, mm -hmm. and their basic thinking was this: if you're a good person. God will bless you. And if God blesses you, obviously you're going to be rich because God is going to bless you with money and health and probably all, all those kind of things, but especially money. So in our day, if, if, if we followed that philosophy, you just look out on the street and the people who drove by in Mercedes or, or Lexuses or something like that, those are the good people because they're rich. 
What does poor in spirit relate to that then? Okay, so that would be the question. Why would Jesus, I mean, what he's doing here, and we're going we're, we're gonna to go right through this as we talk about the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we're going to find out that Jesus attacks almost every one of their favorite, but, uh, but I would add non-biblical philosophies. Does Jesus All their mean, favorite things, he just attacks them directly. Does Jesus mean you're happy if you know that you are a despicable, sinful human and you need God to help you with your life to be a better person? then well, you are indeed blessed and happy? He's really saying, yes, Rec blessed are those, or happy are those who recognize their spiritual need. I have a cross-reference here to Isaiah 66, verse 2. But this is the man to whom I will look, he that is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Mm -hmm. yeah. In other words, it wants to learn. Well, see the... But, I mean, isn't there come a time when you're not so spiritually poor, you're kind of spiritually rich? Well, think about it here. Here's an, <laughs> here's an audience, and who are the rich people? You can look through the, Jesus' audience. If you, if you were there and you could look on the hillside, thousands of people gathered there, almost certainly, maybe 10,000 people gathered there. And I, I don't know how he managed to make himself heard, but, you know, huge audience there watching him. And you could pick out the rich people just just by the way they're dressed, really easily, really quickly. Almost everybody, including Jesus, looked like poor person. He was dressed in the common, ordinary garb of the day. He had no fancy paraphernalia, no fancy clothes, whatever. He was dressed like a poor carpenter or a poor fisherman or something like that. And so, you know, here's someone who recognizes a teacher, and he's teaching them, and he's saying, look at me, and they say, yeah, you, you're, you know, I don't know why we're even listening to you, because you obviously aren't blessed by God, because you're poor. And Jesus says, let me tell you, it's not like that at all. Well, you know, really, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. Like, th there could be two rich people standing there, and one is saying, uh, mm -hmm. uh, thank goodness I'm not like those other people. And the other one is looking down and saying, God, I'm a sinful person, please help. And they could both be rich or they could both be poor. But not in their thinking. Not in our thinking, yes, in, but not in their thinking. Mm -hmm. yes. In defense of these people who thought that you could tell who was mm -hmm. good by uh, who was rich, there are whole chapters in the Old Testament that talk about this. Uh, mm -hmm. Leviticus 26. Yeah. Deuteronomy 7 and Deuteronomy 28. Yeah. They talk about the blessings of obedience yep. and the curses of disobedience. Exactly. So this, you know, their thoughts were biblically founded. Yes. And as they interpreted them. Yeah, as they interpreted them. So have we gotten anywhere with the word spirit? <laughs> well, I, I'm saying blessed are those who recognize their spiritual poverty. If you don't think you need any help, then you're spiritually rich. If you recognize that you need help, even God's help, you're spiritually poor. So and then you're spiritually <clears throat> rich if you, if you think that you're not worth much. Well, yeah. Well, and, and the, the answer to that is not that you think you're not worth much. It's the, the answer to that is you think you need help from someone who can really help you. Desire of Ages uh, has, a, has a word for that. Poor in spirit who crave the presence of an abiding Christ, the humble in heart, those whose highest ambition is to do the will, to do God's will, these will gain an abundant entrance. Yeah. Desire, Desire of Ages 301.4. Yeah. So that's what we're talking about. What, if anything, does this have to do, these who know that they're spiritually poor, have to do with the Laodicean church? That's a good question because if you read the Laodicean message in Revelation 3, rich in clearly rich. they think they're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. So they're exactly in the same category that these Pharisees were in that Jesus was talking to. And okay. isn't our, aren't we the Laodicean people? The now Laodicean be careful, church? be careful here. <laughs> Speak now. for yourself over there. I was speaking <laughs> for you folks, not me. <laughs> Ken, I, I, have, I have heard another explanation uh, about, um, about this Sermon on the Mount, that it is um, 
also a description of spiritual growth mm -hmm. of the person's uh, a Christian experience. Mm -hmm. And of course, that would begin with an understanding that um, one one is one is needy of the spiritual mm -hmm. experience. Yeah, that's where it starts. One sure. has to recognize that one absolutely one is uh, one is is uh, can be separated from God, and the experience starts there. And and when you finally realize that you are spiritually poor, that's what you're recognizing. And getting back to Gordon's comment, probably the Christian Church and I'm talking about not one particular denomination, I'm talking about the entire Christian church, has never felt so comfortable in its history. We're doing well, we're rich, we're increased with goods. We might not even need God's help. We're doing fine, thank you. And we even have coffee shops in our churches. Yes. Well, that's pretty absolute, aren't you? <laughs> like an absolute statement there. Well, look at the history for yourself. Well, you're, I know, but there's been places that you can look at different uh, examples where it wasn't like that with people all the way through, I, and I, and people and the universe can look at those people instead of looking at the the general that you're talking about. But when we talk about Revelation three, we're talking about the general. That's what it's focused on, and I mean, I. Well, I, I, are we are are we taking that? Genesis, uh, Revelation 3, uh, as a connection to this, the well, foreign I, spirit? I, I'm, saying, I'm saying that this would apply to those people, yes, I am. Now, now, if you were trying to work to get more of something, mm -hmm. uh, you may not necessarily think you're poor in it, but you're acting like you are. And, and that's... That's correct. That's exactly right. And that right. may be what he's talking about. It is what he's talking about. But if you, if, you, if you believe that riches are proof of God's blessing and you have them already, then what more do you need? But what if, what if you thirsted for the Word of God? Mm -hmm. Isn't that being poor in spirit too? Well, it is. But the person who's thirsting for, for, God, for, for the Word of God is not the person who says, I'm rich and increased with goods, and I have need of nothing. That's a, those are opposites. Jesus, yeah, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but didn't Jesus also say, I've not come to save the spiritually rich, but the spiritually poor? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he, he, another way of yeah. saying that, I, I, didn't, I didn't come for the healthy people. I came to take care of the sick people. Right. Yeah. There are some parts of the world where the churches are suffering today, though. Yeah, sure. Now, I heard a sermon, it was very good, where it talked about the Sermon on the Mount is the sermon that Jesus gave that he would demonstrate on Calvary, on the Calvary. So the Sermon on the Mount describes what Jesus is going to later demonstrate on Calvary? Correct. I see. What... In, in light of our reading, what we're going through the Gospels chronologically, for those of you who maybe have joined us in the middle of this, and we're, trying, and we're going to do the same thing all the way through the New Testament. Instead of going in the order of the books, we're going to go chronologically. And so what we find is that Jesus has now moved to Galilee. John has been imprisoned, and when John is imprisoned, uh, Jesus decides it's time, you know, things are getting pretty hot in, in Judea, and they are the Pharisees are already determined to kill him. And so he said he takes his small group of disciples and he moves to, to Galilee, where there's not nearly so many Pharisees and not nearly so many authorities from the temple, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he moved to Galilee, and after being there for a little while and getting some things done there, he, uh, he, he says, okay, he goes up, as, we, as Norm read to us, he goes up to the top of the mountain, prays all night, comes down, chooses his disciples, and then talks to them about what his kingdom is all about. This, I think, is the Magna Carta of the Christian church. This is the, this is the he, he's giving his disciples. Now, I personally think that, that this is probably not a single sermon because there's so much material. I mean, how many hundreds and hundreds of sermons have you heard based on the Sermon on the Mount? Hundreds and every, anybody who's been a Christian for very long has heard many, many sermons 
on different parts of this. And if, if the whole sermon is not on this, it, a part of it will be on this, or this will be a ref, cross-reference. I mean, this is, this is the foundation stone of Christianity. So I think this is probably a summary of things that, of different sermons. That he, but basically, he's telling his disciples, okay, this, this is your message. This is what you, you, you're ultimately going to have to go out and tell the world. That's, that's the way I understand this Sermon on the Mount. Okay? If someone were to read what we have written in Matthew, what we call the Sermon on the Mount, it would take just a few minutes. Yeah. And Jesus took most well, of the, the day. day. Apparently the day when, when it was given, he, he spent like the whole day talking. Well, yeah, because like he could say, blessed are the poor in spirit, and everybody would raise their hand and say, can you explain that? Yeah. And so he probably went into it. So I've, I've asked for several times in, in some of our previous sessions uh, um, that when, for example, I, and you will recall, I've said, when Paul went out to preach, what did he preach? What did he say? And so on and so forth. And so what you're saying here is, if I understand you correctly, is Jesus is, is preparing these disciples to go out and preach. Yes. And this is the message that they are to preach. Yes. That would be yeah. a strong interpretation of, of, of your... And if you know what the Pharisees taught and the, what their beliefs were and the laws they made and all this kind of stuff, you're going to find out that Jesus goes bang, 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 bang right through here and he attacks almost just face on, head on their most cherished beliefs. Now, what would you think of a young pastor that shows up, came to your church and said... Let me start out by attacking everything you believe. Is that why they wanted that? Why the church leaders wanted to kill Jesus? Well, partly, yeah. But but why would he do that? Because they were wrong. <laughs> well, yes, okay, fair, uh, fair enough, fair enough. That's that's a good answer. So he wanted to give the correct picture, but in the process of doing that, what did he need to do with his disciples, et cetera, and his followers? He was just their minds. Exactly. And what do we call that? Paradigm shift. A paradigm shift. He's saying to these new disciples that have just been chosen, okay, you are going to be my inner circle of friends who are going to follow me everywhere I go, etc. It's my job to tell you, you have to change completely your way of thinking about a lot of things. And that's because God is not the person that the Pharisees and scribes had made him out to be. Exactly. And Jesus says, I am, I'm, I'm sin of God, and here's how God really is. Yeah. And that's what this is, that's what we're, we're looking at here. And well, this this is a sermon where everything is turned upside down, I've mm -hmm. heard somebody say, and I yeah. think that's a good description. Yeah. Um, it's almost like um, there's there's things that the devil has been preaching all this time and he's probably gone away with it because people have accept, accepted it and now he comes and says flat on these things are wrong turn yeah. it over yeah. you know it really goes this way the highest person is not the best the lowest person is not the best everybody's the same now, look at the lowest person now where is it? this is his third winter his third year in his ministry here we're into it's really his, his, he's been a year and a half into his ministry now. He start, he's starting, well, he's, he's starting at year two and a half. This time in Galilee is going to be from two and a half, um, no, one and a half to two and a half. Is, in, his, in his three and a half years of ministry, we're now a year and a half into that ministry, and he's gone a little ways into it in his Galilee ministry, and now he's, 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 starting, he's starting an intense training program for his disciples. And then, he, so the time in Galilee is from year... Uh, one and a half to year two and a half, then he's going to have a half a year when he takes his disciples way away into the hinterlands and spends his time just with them. And then the final half year, six months, he's going to be traveling through the country, just surrounded with huge crowds of people following him. And basically, he's going to lead them to Jerusalem, where he's hoping a million people are going to be aware. And, you know, Luke 24, the two people on the road to Emmaus, you know, said to Jesus himself, are you the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's been happening there? So that's, that was, that's, that's the goal of his. Can you imagine the disciples? They had to go back on everything 
I mean, Jesus had to be very convincing, and they had to be very strong men in order to do that. And also, that's our duty today in this earth, is, yep. is we go crosshairs with the modern culture. Yeah. Well, just take it. Go ahead, go ahead. So, so Jesus tried to adjust their thinking, tried to shift their paradigm here. But unfortunately, as Joanne said, he wasn't very successful. It right. wasn't until after the Ascension and the Pentecost that they really got it. Yeah. Well, look at this. Do not think that I've come to do away with the Law of Moses and the teachings of the Prophet. I've not come to do away with them to make their teachings come true. Now, that's a fairly simple one to start off. But then it's, where, you have you? I'm looking at Matthew 5, that was verse 17. Okay. So now we're going to go to verse 21. You have heard that people were told in the past, this would be from the Old Testament, do not commit murder. Where is that found? Exodus 20. Sixth commandment. Anyone who does, da, 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 but I tell you, don't get, don't get angry with people. Uh, then you go down, verse 27, you heard it was said, do not commit adultery, but now I tell you, you know, don't even look at a woman across the street, you know. It was also said, verse 31, anyone divorce his wife, so, but now I tell you. Verse 33, you've also heard that people were told in the past. I mean, he's just flat out attacking some of their cherished, I mean, the disciples said, you know, if you're going to treat marriage like that, who would dare to get married? I mean, imagine trying to live with a woman for such a long period of time, you know? <laughs> that, was, that was their attitude. Gordon, I won't ask you to say anything right now. You know, Jesus was, <laughs> going, <better> Jesus was <laughs> going far beyond actions. He was going, and what goes in your mind? Yep. And that's hard to control. I mean, thoughts just breeze through there without. Yeah. How long so, do they get to stay? Yeah. How long do they get to stay? Okay. Yeah. And so what we're having here is this. <clears throat> The disciples, I'm sorry, the Pharisees had taught people, whether you like it or not, you have to follow all these rules. And if you're a Pharisee, you almost had to be independently wealthy because you really didn't have time to earn a living. You had, it was a, almost a full time just to practice your religion. Okay? So that was, that was what they were used to looking at. And the poor man, who wasn't independently wealthy, what were his chances? I mean, how, how can he ever be a Pharisee? and live like those people with fancy robes and so forth, who fasted two days a week and da-da-da-da, all these millions of things. So he, we, didn't, he thought God didn't like him as much. He thought, my chances of being, I'm, I'm thankful that I'm a descendant of Abraham, he would have said, but to be at that level, no way I'm ever going to make it. Sometimes I wonder if all those rules didn't serve them to keep the um, classes separated. The Absolutely. So Ellen White has written a couple of passages, one of which is fairly familiar and one is not familiar at all, that I think summarize a lot of what Jesus said. The first, first one is found in Christ Object Lessons, page 97, the bottom of that page and the top of the next page. The man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely, now that would be the Pharisees and all the people who are trying to follow all their rules, because he's required to do so, you know, you don't have the option here. You have to do these things or you're supposed to. We'll never enter into the joy of obedience. How often? Never. Never enter into the joy of obedience. He does not obey. So he may be following. He may be marching to church on Sabbath morning. He may be sitting there. But if he wishes he were somewhere else, it's no good. When the requirements of God are accounted a burden because they cut across human inclination, we may know that the life is not a Christian life. This is pretty... That's pretty heady. That's pretty heady. You better believe it. True obedience is the outworking of a principle within. That's what Jesus is talking about. We're talking about what's inside there. Mm -hmm. The true obedience is the outworking of a principle within. It springs from the love of righteousness, the love of the law of God. The essence of all righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer. This will lead us to do right because it is right, because right doing is pleasing to God. That's Christ's Lessons 97 and 98. Now, to, to drill down a little deeper into that, why that's true, I now read from what was originally Signs of the Times, July 22, 1897, paragraph 11, if you have a, some way of looking that up, and it says this, a sullen submission, that means you do it even if you don't want to, but you do it because it's required. 
a sullen submission to the will of the Father will develop the character of a rebel. So what were the, what were the Pharisees producing by all their requirements? Rebels. A whole lot of rebels. But such a one, by such a one, service is looked upon as drudgery. It is not rendered cheerfully. And in the love of God, it is a mere mechanical form, performance. If he dared, such a one would disobey. His rebellion is smothered, ready to break out at any moment in bitter murmurings and complaints. So is this person a real Christian? Are they happy about what they're doing? Not at all. Such service brings no peace or quietude to the soul. So Jesus is saying, you have been suppressed. You have been tried. I mean, they have tried, these people have tried to force you to do this and this and this and this plus a hundred other things. He says, forget all those things. Let me talk about real religion and real righteousness. And that's the Sermon on the Mount. Did she really use the word submission? Yes. As a negative? Yes. Are we supposed to submit to God? Well, submitting to God is very different than submission to somebody else. It's, just, it's, it's a sullen, sullen submission. submission. Yeah, it's a sullen submission. Yeah, that's the part. So, what's the you difference? Know? Sullen <laughs> submission means you're submitting God. because you think you have to, and certainly not because you want to. Well, submit, <laughs> submitting, yeah. I still don't see what the difference is. <laughs> Because, well, um, well, I can tell you, Islam, if you're in prison, if you're in prison, if you're in prison, you do what the prison guard says, whether you like it or not. That's sullen, That's submission. sullen and, submission. And um, and the other submission is different? The submission to God, the real Christian submission to God means, God, I do what you tell me to do because I recognize that it's the right thing. I will be best off if I do what you tell me to but do. But aren't you doing the same thing? No, not at all. Well, I've, I've Modi is entirely I'm just, different. I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm, I'm not saying. talking anything about your Christian experience. I'm just talking about mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, you I may mean, end up like, doing this close to the same thing, but the motive, the, what's behind it is totally different. Okay. I'm happy, you, you, I'm happy to do it is the proper way, and I am not happy, and I'm going to be unhappy the entire time I'm submitting, and the first chance I get, I'm not going to submit when there you're you go. gone. That's a sullen approach. You know, it, Have you never submitted generously or willingly, or has it always been sullen? Okay, I recognize there's a different, <laughs> different motive for submitting, Yes. right? <laughs> okay, but uh, doesn't, isn't that the, what the word Islam means? Submit, yeah. yeah. Submit. Mm -hmm. So, um, submit jihad. could be a bad word, it could be a good word, but just mm -hmm. because you use the word doesn't yeah. mean that you're hitting the right well, thing. Well, submission by itself isn't the question. The question is, is this sullen or is it intelligent. happy, intelligent submission? Is it, do you do it by choice or you do it because you think you have to? That's the part that's the question. It's not the submission. You have to. You still have to do it by choice. Does, does there come a time <laughs> when... It's chance, the first chance you get. It's, it's, it's just we're using words that don't necessarily come across to all people unless they okay, have Okay, well, we're running out of time for our first section, but what do you think Jesus was talking about when he talked about the law and the prophets? We need to, we need to clarify that. When he said the law and the prophets, what was he referring to? Now, remember... None of what we call the New Testament had even been dreamed of yet, hadn't been written yet, etc. So we'll discuss that when we come back. Don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We're in the middle of a discussion of the Sermon on the Mount, which occurred in the Galilean portion of Jesus' three and a half years of ministry while he was here on this earth. And we ended up by just asking the question, what did Jesus mean when he said the law and the prophets? We'll just take a moment to go over that. Um, in, the old, in the Jewish Bible, if you were to look at a book, which today would be called a Tanakh, you would find out that the first portion, the five books of Moses, was called the Torah or the Law. A next large section is called the Prophets, and it includes, interestingly enough, books like Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea. Those sound like prophets to us. Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Those are the prophets. And then there was a third section called the writings, or sometimes called the Psalms, because the first book in that section was called the Psalms. Then Proverbs, Job, Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel. Daniel was not in the prophets in their, in their Bible. Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. So those were the law and the prophets. Now, does that mean when Jesus refers to your law, he meant just the writings of Moses? Well, not really, because there are times when Jesus, uh, for example, look at John 10, 34, just as an illustration very quickly. John 10, 34. And Jesus says there, Jesus answered, it is written in your own law that God said, ye or you are God's. And he's using that as an illustration. But all we want to point out now is he's talking about in your own law, and he's quoting from that third section of the Old Testament, which we, call, we would call, or they would call, the writings today. So when Jesus says the law, or the law and the prophets, or occasionally even the law of the prophets and the Psalms, or the law of the prophets and the writings, he's really referring to, if not all, probably most of the Old Testament. Um, so coming back to Matthew 5, is it really, really even possible for Jesus to say, love your enemies? He does. He does. He says yes. it. Yes. Yes. And I quote, this is Matthew 5, 43. You have heard that it was said, love your friends, hate your enemies. But now I tell you, and, and I mean, what, 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 we know that the, the, the Jewish society in Jesus' day was a very class society. The Sadducees hardly would speak to a Pharisee. The Pharisees would hardly speak to a Sadducee. And neither of them would hardly ever speak to a poor person. I mean, there were groups like this and very distinct rules about and, and, and customs about who you could talk to and who you couldn't talk to. What was amazing is they didn't even want a Samaritan shadow to fall no. on them. No, no. Well, you've heard that it was said, love your friends and hate your enemies. But now I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may become the children of your, heavenly, of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun to shine on bad and good people alike and gives rain to those who do good and to those who do evil. Why should God reward you if you love only the people who love you? Even the tax collectors do that. I wonder what Matthew thought when he heard him say that. Even the tax collectors do that. And if you speak only to your friends... Have you done anything out of the ordinary? Even the pagans do that. You must be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. What a state, what a way to end your, your the first punchline at the end of your sermon. If the people aren't, aren't dizzy now by what you've said, this ought to do it, right? What does he mean when he says you must be perfect? Or love your enemies, for that matter? Well, he came, we were his enemies. Mm -hmm first, mm -hmm. and then before we came to him. So mm -hmm. he accepted us, so he's our example. Mm -hmm. So we should forgive those who have sinned against us. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Perfect yeah. When you talk about perfect, perfect's meaningless unless you have some sort of dimension to it. Mm -hmm. If you just say perfect, well then you're just pulling something out of the air. That's why he added the dimension. The, your the father, in heaven. father in heaven. Yeah, but even your Father in heaven, if you ca talk about perfect, he is the only one that's perfect. But you've got to have some sort of dimension and context, or else you can't, you don't know what you're talking about. So give me an example of Spoken what would like be... Spoken like a true engineer. 
Mm -hmm. no, well, I but mean, I mean, if it says, be you perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect, if that's not dimension, no, what dimension, is? The dimension he's talking about is love, right there. Yeah. He's not talking about almighty power. He's not talking about being able to add your timetables up perfectly or anything like that. Yeah. He's talking about love. Yes. And, and as and soon as you start fine. talking about, well, that's what I'm saying, but when you jab in that word perfect, sometimes you start yeah. thinking the whole universe perfect, is coming down on top of perfect you. Perfect here is a word that means mature. It means fully mature. It means you go out to your garden and you find a peach or let's say a tomato maybe or something like that. Those are the dimensions perfect. you're talking about. Yeah. When you grab a peach, you know what a good peach looks yeah. like and when it's perfect. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it may not, you may have two peaches, it may have a different shape or whatever, but whatever the dimension it is that you're, you're using is perfect, it is perfect. Mm -hmm. We don't so. know what God is, and we don't have Him defined. And so somebody may think they're perfect following God, and they're not really doing that. You know, my, my son phrased it once very well, and I like it. He says, you're never really perfect until you're becoming more perfect. Mm-hmm. More more perfect? I've heard of it's more des described I mean. as an offer as opposed to a command. Mm -hmm. you, like if you, yeah, you got lung cancer, well, what do you want? Just be partly cured or do you want to be t completely restored? Yeah. Uh, as one example. So. Well, it's interesting that the word here, you must be perfect, is in the Greek, it just so happens that the exact same spelling of that you are to be or you will be or you must be. Is it, the subjective form of the verb is exactly the same spelling as the future of, the, of that word. So the, this, mm -hmm. this is, you will be perfect or you must be perfect. They're spelled exactly the same. So Goodspeed, I think, did the best of any translator when he said, you are to be perfect. You are to be, you know. Sometime in the future, you are to be perfect. And then, like, you can think of the sergeant at the barracks said, you know, beds will be made at 8 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the morning, whatever. You are to be perfect. So it, it, that, that's probably the closest translation into, into the real meaning of this word in, in English. Okay? So, so but, well, that has no time frame on it when you do it that way. Yeah. And so do you think there's any th that this has any time frame to it? No. Well... You're, when you approach God, we're going to be approaching God for Forever. eternity, you know, mm -hmm. so you will be perfect. So mm -hmm. You're pointing the I right direction. I think it works. I think it works right there. Mm -hmm. What do you think Jesus planned for us to do with the Lord's Prayer? Pray it. Pray it? <laughs> if you look at that prayer, you notice something very interesting. Where are you? I'm looking now at Matthew 6. Our Father in heaven, I'm looking, starting with verse 9. Our Father in heaven, may your holy name be honored. I'm reading from the Good News Bible. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. Forgive us the wrongs we have done as we forgive the wrongs that others have done to us. Do not bring us to hard testing, but keep us safe from the evil one, period. Do we ever quote it like that? <coughs> No. What happened to the, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen? Mine is in brackets. brackets. Yeah. yeah that Why would it be in brackets? It was, it was added. added. Added? How can you add something to Scripture? Just write it in. <laughs> Just write very, it in. Very energetic, very enthusiastic, <laughs> and they really love the Lord and wanted to add their little... Well, it turns out that in the oldest documents, those final words are not there. And you might say, well, who had the right to add them in? Well, someone back at the beginning recognized that people were going to probably be memorizing this, this prayer. And if you go through and look at prayers in other parts of the Bible, those kind of words come at the end. It's an appropriate thing to have in the end. So they said, well, why don't we just finish this off instead of just sort of leave you hanging there? We'll finish it off with what they call a doxology. And so they decided to put it in. And it, it, it's not, it's not you know, uninspired, it is inspired. You could, they just took something from another part of the Bible and put it in here. It wasn't in Matthew's original text. It may not have been what Jesus said in the beginning, but it was, it was put there. Okay? So, uh, 
How do you feel about that? Someone added something to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Well, there's a lot of things you have to add just to translate it correctly or to make it, have it make sense. So All, all translation is interpretation. Mm -hmm. Yes, very much so. At least it's in brackets to give you a clue. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there is a, another, another argument. It's pretty outlandish, but it could be that the person who put those words in here had access to more ancient manuscripts than we have now, mm -hmm. and it was in there, and it wasn't in the manuscript that he had, and so he just said, hey, this has been left out, we better put that in. Although I'm not sure many biblical scholars would... <laughs> Well, that if you had system. only one ancient document, that might you might buy that. Mm -hmm. When you've got a number of them, not not a whole, huge number, but uh, uh, you know, and you look across the spectrum, some that came from the east and some that came from the west, etc., and they all the earliest ones all have this missing, then it's pretty hard to make that argument. Um, and I w I will say that there are those who look at the Bible and say, you know. The Bible has been corrupted by modern scholars, so they leave out passages like this. They're in the footnote. This is in the footnote in my Bible. But I, that's not corrupting when we try to return to what was the closest to the original text as far as we can determine. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's, that's one of the issues. So to re-ask your question, what are we to do with this Lord's Prayer? Well, I, th I think we need to repeat it just the way we've been doing it. I think, however that if you look at the prayer, Jesus is giving us a sample of the kind of things we need to pray for. All the major things we need to pray for are covered in one way or another in that brief prayer. This was not so much intended to be, you know, a sample for us to just memorize so we can do it half asleep, you know, down beside our bed or, or repeat it in church sometime with a whole crowd and, and you get to the end and you realize you haven't even thought about a single word that you said. You just sort of, you just float off the t your tongue just because you'd memorized it. Um, that's not what Jesus intended, I'm absolutely certain. By the way, how about calling it the Lord's Prayer? Does it say anywhere this is the Lord's Prayer? This is how you should pray. How you should pray. The Lord's Prayer is actually found in John 17. That was his prayer. This should be our prayer. It shouldn't be the Lord's Prayer. Um, in this prayer, can you explain, and do not lead us into temptation? I didn't think God led us into temptation. Well, uh, probably a better word for there would be testing. Yeah, I, I was looking at that at verse 13. Please my, do not test me. In my verse it says, do not bring us to hard testing. Yes. Sometimes I pray that, mm -hmm. especially whenever I read the book of Job. <laughs> I'm like, Lord, please do not well, you know, send me down that path. I'm not strong like Job. We get a certain age, we feel like we've had enough tests. <laughs> yeah, well, but the point is here, we believe that a generation, sometime, hopefully not too far in the future, is going to face hard testing. And Jesus prayed, let this cup pass from me. What's he praying for? Uh, not to be crucified. Well, and he's yeah. saying, yeah, not please let this, let this hard testing pass from me. It doesn't mean God is going to answer that prayer. It means that you... In the way he... There you go. But not That's my right. will. That's exactly... Your will. <laughs> Jesus went I mean, on to... Jesus is telling us to pray a prayer here. Which he prayed. Our prayer that he knows God may not answer. Of course. Well, that's kind but of... But he will answer it. He'll answer it. He'll answer it. It just may not be the way you want him to. Exactly. <laughs> or, or at the time when you want him to. You get harder testing instead of hard testing. <laughs> <laughs> that's also possible. <laughs> uh, I think there will be some interesting discussions with Job in the future. <laughs> I don't know how to deal with that part there. You know, <laughs> not bring us hard testing. It, it's interesting. You know, what started all this, uh, didn't a disciple ask him, teach us how to pray? Mm-hmm. You know, I always thought that was pretty elementary, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, I I actually ran into that one time. Somebody said, boy, you really know how to pray. How come you you can pray so well? You know, I, I thought this was crazy. So I said, well, I guess it's just practice. And I guess, mm -hmm. basically, he yeah. gave them something to start yeah. with so that they could practice. Mm -hmm. And then it comes out easier after that. Yeah, yeah. So... 
And well, also a little bit before this, it says, when you're praying, do not use meaningless repet repetitions as the Gentiles do. Yes. What were the Gentiles doing? And also, would that be praise songs? Where well, they say the same thing over and over? Sometimes, and over sometimes and over. it's like that, yes. Yeah. And if you go to the Gentiles, you go to the pagans, I mean, the, the Hindus, for example, quite often will put, and Buddhists will put uh, a little wheel in a, in a stream and the wheel spins around and, and there's a little prayer attached to the side that's, that's turned like this and they believe that every time that goes around, a prayer is going to heaven. See, in that way, lots and lots of prayers, certainly if God's a little hard of hearing, a lot of prayers are going to be better than, than, than one prayer. So. I think there's examples, though, that are worse than praise songs. Because you know, like the kid that goes to, goes to bed, now I lay me down to sleep, says so the same thing over and over again. I mean, what are you learning when you do that? You know, except getting into the habit of saying these words without thought yeah. or thinking. Yeah. You know, so. Well, and, but eventually you certainly hope the child grows up enough so they can. But you're thankful if he can learn how to pray like this to start out with. No, well, that's true. But um, yeah. and there may be uh, repetition true. is... Very is pretty straightforward what he's talking about. Well, I, same with I remember a good friend of mine who, who once called some praise songs and says these are like 7-Eleven songs. <laughs> it's seven words repeated 11 times. <laughs> so, uh, well, we, we, we can't spend a, a whole lot more time on the Sermon on the Mount, but basically this is Jesus sort of giving his disciples, a, 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 if you will, charting out a, a course that he wants. And basically he's saying, what we're trying to accomplish here, my friends, is a paradigm shift. And to suggest that is the very last, last verse, the last two verses actually in the Sermon on the Mount. Look at Matthew 7, 28 and 29. When Jesus finished saying these things, the crowd was amazed at the way he taught. He wasn't like the teachers of the law. Instead, he taught with authority. What was Jesus' authority? He knew exactly what he was talking about. It sounded like. <laughs> okay. I mean, what, what was different about the teaching of Jesus? Well, he was the Messiah. Okay. He is the Messiah. But he didn't announce that. No. And the children seemed to recognize it, and those in the courtyard seemed to recognize it. So what was. Why? What was different? I, I don't know. There we could talked have about been this last time, like, and I still don't. There could have been things like, you know, Rabbi such and such says this, and Rabbi such and such says this, and he didn't say anything like that. He just no. said, this is how it is, you know. Well, but, so. but that's, not, that's not the real key here. The real key to, to Jesus' teaching was that he gave stories and illustrations, and he gave things from fishing, he gave things from gardening, he gave things from... And these were illustrations that the, everybody was familiar with. They knew about what happens when the guy goes out and scatters his seed. You know, some falls on the stony path, some falls among the rocks, some falls on the good soil, etc. All of them knew that. So that had several very important lessons for us. One, he used common illustrations. Those common illustrations meant that, that um, Every time this person would be walking down a road or down a path or whatever, and they would see something, what would they think of? The story. The story. They would think of Jesus' point. So Jesus is getting his sermons repeated not just one time. He's getting them repeated hundreds of times because at least in those people who were, who were interested and willing to, to do so, those stories got repeated and repeated and repeated in their minds as they saw them illustrated every day. And two... Virtually every one of Jesus' illustrations, parables, whatever you choose to call them, are such that when you, when you see them and you hear them, you say, yeah, obviously that's true. You know, it, it's ob the conclusion is obvious. You can't beat around. I mean, he would say things that are so obvious, even to the Pharisees, you know, they're just, they're just, they're, they're walk away with their mouths hanging open. There's nothing, there's no response. The answer is obvious. And so, this is the kind of authority. When you speak the truth and then you illustrate it with something that everybody recognizes, oh yeah, that's the truth, then what are you doing? You're speaking with authority. The Pharisees, by contrast, would say, well, Rabbi so-and-so says this, and Rabbi so-and-so says this, but those don't quite agree. But then Rabbi so-and-so came along and he illustrated, and Rabbi so-and-so said, I mean, back in, uh, and I, I, think, I think of this illustration, in the Dark Ages, 
in Europe when they first were setting up universities. One of the discussions that was, w was debated for a long period of time was how many horse, how many teeth does a horse, ha the horse have? Now you look at me like, what in the world are we talking about here? You go out and you look at the horse and you count his teeth, right? But it turns out that some of the authorities that they were studying that lived hundreds of years before them and therefore were regarded as great authorities didn't agree on how many teeth a horse had. So that becomes a huge issue. What do you do? Well, we're on this guy's side or we're on that side. Da, da, da. No, the truth is how many teeth that look at the horse for yourself. See, It was that kind of difference that Jesus' authority was from all the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees. Well, you know, also what's hard to do is to put something, co something complicated in simple terms. Yeah. And even today, if you read a lot of their religious scholars, you can't even make sense of their sentence. I mean, you're lost when you get to the end of the sentence. And just to make something simple and clear is very, mm -hmm. very difficult. And that would, to me, is the character of God. He brings everything so simple that even a child can understand it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there's some advanced communication happening here that was way advanced for that time. And there's some preachers that need to read it and still learn today some of yeah. those techniques. Surrounding the Sermon on the Mount, and probably in connection with it, or connected with which this may have happened on several days, not just on one, there were a lot of healing ministries. Look at Matthew 8 and 9 and go back to the end of Matthew 4 and so forth. Um, but there's an interesting e e question comes up in Matthew 9 and verse 30. Jesus has just healed two blind men. And Jesus touched their eyes and said, let it happen then just as you believe. That's verse 29. And then verse 30, and their sight was restored. Jesus spoke sternly to them. Does that sound like the Jesus you know about? Jesus spoke sternly to them. Don't tell this to anyone. But they left to spread the news about Jesus all over that part of the country. Why would Jesus say, don't tell anyone? The way I read it in mine it says, Jesus sternly warned them, saying, see here, let no one know about this. I can just see him. He's got these kids that are so excited they can see. And he's kind of having to slap their hands and go, listen to me. Mm -hmm. But they're not, they're so excited they can't contain themselves. And why would, I mean, Jesus knew that was going to happen. So why did he tell them not to tell? And this isn't the only illustration. This happened a number of times through his ministry. We're trying to just summarize some of the main points of things that Jesus did, did through his ministry. Did he not want to draw attention to himself? At this point. Well, at this point, here's what was going on. So many people were looking for Jesus, and so many people were following him around everywhere he went. He couldn't even go into a town. The crowds would just smother the place. So he'd had to go out in the fields, and he was... He was you know, if he, if he went out there, the people would come out there. And he, his, his goal was not to just be the local, all the local hospitals rolled up in one person. His goal was to teach the truth about God. So he's saying to these guys, don't just go because if you go around telling the whole country, you know, I was blind and now I'm healed, what's every blind man going to do? What's every leper, every leper going to do? What is every person with a serious illness going to do? And what will Jesus spend all his time trying to accomplish? Yeah, the only thing I have time to do is healing. Right? And it might make the Pharisees and scribes even angrier that Jesus is looked at as a powerful person. Yeah. Well, the next thing we see here, and we're, we're, we're going to wind up this session shortly, is Jesus sends them out. Look at Luke 8. Start, starting with the first three, well, basically the first three verses. Something very interesting happens. Luke 8. Sometime later, um, Jesus traveled through towns and villages preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. The twelve disciples went with him, and so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been driven out, Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer in Herod's court, and Susanna, and many, many other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. What's going on here? 
men are tight wads and women aren't. <laughs> I see, okay. How does that help us to understand these stories? Well, maybe the men were busy working and these women were available to um, keep the little um, budding church going. Yeah. And they fully believed in this gospel message. It's interesting that it says they supported Jesus and his disciples with their means. With their money? Uh -huh. Yeah. Very well, interesting. I thought women in this generation were property and chattel and had no rights and couldn't speak up and had no property and didn't have any money and did everything their husbands maybe, said. And maybe that's why these women were following Jesus. Where'd they get this money if they... And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Like Mary, Mary Magdalene. Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod mm -hmm. Stewart, and Susanna, had he cast devils out of all of them? Not necessarily. Uh, there's a pretty good chance that this, this um, Joanna was the mother, and Chusa was the father of the young boy that was healed when Jesus went, was, uh, was in Cana of Galilee, back in, back in John 2. I don't want to go into all the details of that, but if you look back there, you'll find out that Jesus had healed a nobleman's son, and it's quite possible as this. And this mother is, is saying, man, you know, this, this guy saved the life of my child. I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support him whatever I can, way I can. So let's wind up the last few seconds that we have here to talk about what we have learned about Jesus from our time together. We have seen that Jesus came from heaven, recognizing that the truth had been so perverted that he needed a complete change in the way people were thinking. He needed a paradigm shift in their thinking. And the Sermon on the Mount was intended to shake them up and say the time has come to rethink everything. And he chose 12 disciples specifically to, to stand close to him and never let themselves be separated from him and say, listen carefully because someday soon it's going to be your job to take this message, the foundation message of the Christian church, and take it to the whole world. And this is the beginning of really the Christian church in that journey. See you again next week.